So the next game up on our list is uh, Dishonored. And Dishonored is kind of an interesting game to talk about in this context in terms of immersive sims and everything like that. And it was my first experience with Arcane Studios, and it's where I started to develop what I call Arcane Syndrome, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But basically, Dishonored was sort of touted or advertised by people in the company as a spiritual successor to Thief. And that has kind of been Arcane's, like, MO, which is why I'm a little bit excited for Deathloop, because Deathloop seems to be one of the first games they're coming out with that isn't really trying to be a sort of brand X uh, version of a Looking Glass game because they don't own the actual IP rights. So, uh, but basically every other thing they did prior to this, you, you've got uh, Arx Fatalis, their first game was basically uh, their rendition, and I already covered this, is their rendition of Ultima Underworld. Uh, Dishonored was supposed to be their rendition of Thief, and of course Prey is supposed to be their rendition of System Shock. Basically the, the, the trifecta of games that Looking Glass is famous for. And so Dishonored was really touted as this sort of spiritual successor to Thief. It has a... well, it depends who you talk to. If you talk to me, I don't think it's that similar. But it's somewhat similar setting with this sort of... Uh, Victorian steampunk aesthetic, so it's it's sort of like Victorian times, and I think uh, homages to Thief include the fact that even though officers and, and police officers and stuff like that have firearms, they still carry swords with them. Um, so it's like Vic Victorian, but with like sort of uh, 18th century vibes as well, so rather than being like uh, late 19th century or mid to late 19th century, it's got sort of like 18th century vibes. But then, of course, they do have access to technology that is well and beyond where, you know, where it would make sense in terms of our reality. You know, they have, like, these force field things that vaporize you if you go through. They have uh, these motorized, uh, mechanized, uh, like, robot suit type things. Um, they have uh, electric lighting that, that's, that doesn't look like uh, sort of incandescent bulbs. Um, or filament-based bulbs that you would have at the time. They give, this, give off this very blue sort of fluorescent vibe. Um, so there's a there's a techno edge to it, much like uh, Thief had this medieval setting with a techno edge to it, and then Victorian stylings for certain things like certain people's clothes or certain um, uh, design. The 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 art design of certain rooms or certain houses was very Victorian, sort of clashing with the the med medieval aesthetic. But of course, a lot of they had things like gas lamps, which is Victorian and not really. Uh, possible in medieval times. They had gas lamps, they had um, uh, actual electric light sources, they had power generators, uh, they did have like electric motorized robots in Thief 2 and things like that, so Dishonored's sort of taking a cue, at least in its world, from Thief. And then of course, um, sort of the dark nature of it too. Thief is a very dark world with lots of uh, poverty and crime and corruption and um, uh, things like that, and uh, Dishonored is as well. It's a very sort of uh, dreary, sort of dark, uh, dour world with uh, lots of poverty, and then of course there's this plague sweeping through the game, and uh, through, excuse me, sweeping through the city in the game, and everything like that, um, with uh, despotic dictators, and you know the assassination of uh, the sovereign of the the city, and all of these kinds of things. Like it's it's a very dark sort of universe. Um, and there's lots of drugs and, and gambling and street crime and, and, you know, alcoholism and things like that in the game. Um, so it was definitely borrowing notes from the Thief universe in that as well. Uh, in addition to that, Dishonored, uh, the gameplay style can be like Thief to some extent. It, it was really billed as being this sort of stealth game where, you know, you, you quietly creep through the streets and, uh, you know, they, they even call the guards there the city watch um, and everything's like that. You know, so many references to Thief. And the whole point of the game is to, you know, make it through these large, open-ended environments to your target, uh, do whatever you have to do, and then get back out, which the only difference, at least on paper, between a mission structure in Thief and in Dishonored would be in Thief you'd be stealing something at your final destination, or your middling destination, and in Dishonored you would be killing someone. 
well, Dishonored really has an identity crisis, in my opinion. They they advertised it as being sort of a spiritual successor to Thief, and when you play it, it feels very Thief-esque. I remember my first time playing it, I was like, wow, this feels incredibly like Thief. I wonder if these guys are fans. Um, because that was part of the marketing for fans of Looking Glass, to be like, hey, it's like Thief, you know? Uh, but I was really into the idea of assassination, and I was really into games like Hitman and the first Assassin's Creed, so when Dishonored was announced, I thought it was like a first-person Hitman game, where the idea was you're in this sort of like 18th century meets 19th century sort of um, nautically inclined uh, culture's city, and you are tasked with uh, killing various people in the city, and you you have to figure out how to do it. So much like Hitman, you can poison them and, and get away like scot free, or you can you know make a chandelier fall on their head and make it look like an accident, or you can go in guns blazing and really send a message. Um, I th that's a lot of the promotional material at the time of the game really sort of build it thusly as well. And there was a lot of focus on the superpowers as well, the magical abilities of Corvo in the game. So. Dishonored had a bit of an identity crisis because then when I played it and it was playing like Thief to some extent, um, it it was odd for me. Um, and I felt that combat was way too difficult to engage in and so I stuck to the shadows and crept around. The problem is, in comparisons to Thief, is that Thief has an excellent stealth system and the beauty of Thief's stealth system is that it's elegant. And elegance is usually um, a result of simplistic design that just works. Every part of it works, but there's not a ton of moving pieces, you know? So, kind of like a bolt-action rifle. A lot of bolt-actions don't have, like, a ton of moving parts. Uh, and all the parts are really solidly built, and that's why they just last forever, and you can put really high-caliber rounds in them. They just, they're just solid and elegant. Um, especially for the time period, you know, you could you could shoot very sort of rapidly with a bolt-action rifle compared to most other firearms technology uh, prior to that technology, and, and you could do so reliably, um, and you could do so with much larger, uh, more high, powerful uh, rounds. So, but you know, so yeah, Thief was like the bolt-action rifle in some sense. Um, it was stealth that didn't have a ton of elements to it, but all of those elements were refined to a to a T, and all of those elements were just worked seamlessly, more or less. And Dishonored, it's funny, for being such a spiritual successor to Thief, or at least touting itself as that, uh, ignores most of the stealth <laughs> elements of King Thief, uh, m most notably of which is the Light Gem. And I don't know why modern stealth games do not utilize a light gem. I don't know why it's just become, like, it's almost as if there's a law against it, or it's taboo or something like that. I have no idea why, because it, it just makes stealth gameplay work so much better. And if you don't have a light gem, if the player can't determine how visible they are, then stealth kind of breaks down, because the player needs to have a certain degree of certainty that if they're in a certain area, or in certain camouflage, or in certain cover or foliage that they're not being seen and you know stealth modern stealth today is, is so boring because like yeah you have that you have this sort of binary stealth in, in modern games but it's things like stealth grass we have to move from a patch of grass to a patch of grass and it means that it's all predetermined and pre-baked and you have no control over it whereas thief was based on lighting so yeah a lot of the lighting is pre-baked into the game you can only you know certain Shadows are already certain places, but you could also create your own shadows in the game. Um, and you could use bits of shadow that maybe were just there to be more decorative, but uh, if you get in close enough, you can hide in them. and Things like that. And, and then once your light gem goes completely dark, you can be fairly certain that as long as a guard doesn't bump into you, um, you won't get spotted. And it still is pretty tense when they pass by, because you're like, okay, is the path I'm going to get close enough? Like, oh crap. But you know as long as they don't touch you, you'll be fine. I mean, as long as you don't make noise. And I, I hate modern stealth games like Metal Gear Solid V, for example, where, you know, and, and even the Far Cry games where it, it's all dependent on these little arrows that pop up. 
Um, and that is still, I don't know if I'm hidden or not. I don't, you know, you, the, the, I think in a good stealth game, the player needs to traverse from dangerous zones to dangerous zones, but then wind up back in zones where they're pretty, they're pretty sure they're not going to be seen. And with these stupid, like, enemy, you know, arrow things, these little indicators that pop up on your HUD, that says like, oh, an enemy over there is seeing you. you. You keep asking yourself why. You're like, I'm in tall grass, it's dark. There's a lot of obstruction between me and him. Why can he see me? And it's all line of sight based bullshit. And the game doesn't do really great calculations to determine how visible the player is. And it's also difficult for the player to determine when that calculation will result in a zero visibility. So just put a light gem in and stop trying to do all this other crap that doesn't seem to work, you know? Um, because most of the time it breaks, and most of the time if an enemy is facing you, regardless of, you know, if you're submerged underneath a tar pit, uh, they'll be able to see you. Uh, Thief elegantly solved this with just a light gem, and the best stealth games since them have copied this mechanic. Uh, the Splinter Cell series almost entirely, except for, I think, even Blacklist, I think, has this, but Blacklist is kind of a, the black sheep, go figure, of the family, including Conviction. Um... But all the Splinter Cell games that matter had the the light gem in them where you could, you know, it would either flash green or you'd have, like, the light meter or something like that, and it would tell you, like, yeah, Sam is totally obscured by darkness now. You're, you're cool. Um, and uh, Styx Shards of Darkness, a more recent 4A8 into uh, uh, stealth games, copied the light gem mechanic as well, and that worked really well. I had a lot of fun with that game. Even though it's very difficult, I still... The stealth was manageable. I never got frustrated with the stealth because I knew exactly what I could do and what I couldn't do, and so I could formulate a plan of attack. It wasn't just like, well, whatever the game decides. Um, and even Metal Gear Solid 3 had a good stealth system, with the, and Metal Gear Solid 4 too, with the camouflage system, because once you blend in with the Octo Camo from Metal Gear Solid 4, you can be uh, very assured that you are invisible to the enemy, more or less, unless they step on you. Um, and Metal Gear Solid 3, of course, had the camo system as well, where you would see a percentage of visibility. And I, I can't remember if 100%, I think it was maybe percent camouflage. So if you wore, let's say you were in rocky dirt, you know, you were on like a mountain pass with like rocky dirt. Well, you'd put on your, your mountain chocolate chip camo or whatever, and you would blend in really well, and then it would be very difficult for enemies to see you. And so you could be very certain that they wouldn't spot you. This didn't work well in MGS5. In MGS5, they introduced the camo system from MGS3, sort of, except they don't have in, there's no indications to the player about how well your camo is working. And so once again, it's just, it's basically random chance, because the, the under the hood dice rolls and, and number generation that the game is doing are very inconsistent. And of course, Dishonored, Dishonored makes the same damn mistake with the stupid little, I think Dishonored has the stupid little cones that pop up, the little uh, indication cones to show you if an enemy has spotted you or something like that. And this just means that, once again, you know, basically you kind of have to keep every single guard's back to you throughout the entire playthrough unless you have a higher elevation than them or they're going to spot you at some point. And it breaks the stealth that made Thief work, because in Thief you could get in close to guards, you could you could go on the other side of the room and be, you know, unseen as you passed by because there were there was darkness to, to hide yourself in and things like that. And the, the stealth in, in Dishonor just you know, I've played it enough to make it work. And you have to do a lot of things like use cover, use distractions, knock out or kill every single guard you see, things like that. Um, I mean, I have 100%ed every Dishonored game, gotten all the achievements, so obviously the stealth can be manageable, but it's never good, it never feels good, and honestly, when I 100%ed the, um, I can't remember the name of the achievement, but basically you can't be spotted the entire game, when I got that for every single Dishonored, this is 1, 2, and Death of the Outsider, oh, and Brigmore Witches as well, every single time I got that achievement, it was just constant quick saving and quick loading. You know, whereas in Thief, I don't really have to quick save all the time because once again, I can be, I can come up with plans of attack and be relatively sure that I can make it to that corner without being spotted. You know, because I know the game's mechanics, and once I get to the corner, I will be safe. So 
Dishonored Stealth is not the worst I've ever seen, but it could have been so much better with the addition of a light gem, would have made it 9 billion times better. Um, the other issue with Dishonored is that they tried to do the sound pop propagation that was in uh, the original Dark Engine, and it just doesn't work. Um, sometimes, you know, a guard will be on a floor above you, and it'll sound like he's right next to you, because he's, at least in terms of the XY coordinates, he is in the same spot as you, but on the Z axis, he's not. He's above you. And, um... The game doesn't know how to calculate that, and it's it's really, really bad with its sound propagation. It's really, really bad. Not as bad as some other games, but it's pretty bad. Thief 2014, for example, was way worse. But Dishonored, basically you can't use it to track the enemy, and the, the designers uh, realized this, and so they gave you things like x-ray vision and stuff like that in the game that you, had, that you could use. Um, I think in Dishonored 2 it works a little bit better, but in, in the first Dishonored it doesn't work very well, and it's it's very hard to track your enemies on on sound alone, and you will need uh, visual confirmation more often than not to really be sure where they are. Um, so there's issues with the stealth there. Uh, one of the things I do like about the stealth is that um, they do try to add in things that are in like Thief to a, to some extent. Walking on metal versus stone doesn't really have a significant impact on how quiet you are, but there will be things like um, physics objects or, or broken glass or things like that in the world that you need to wor you know uh, avoid knocking over or avoid passing over when you're sneaking through areas. And uh, another thing I really liked is that um, much like in the original Thief, you can do uh, you can do backstabs or you can do knockouts, and of course the knockouts are non-lethal and but and faster. But that means that if the... I think guards can wake up unconscious enemies, so you have to be careful of that. But it is a lot faster than killing people. And then, of course, it's completely silent. Um, and you can even get an upgrade where I think Corvo uh, immediately puts the enemy over his shoulder so you can move the body very quickly. Uh, versus lethal attacks, like backstabs and stuff like that, will permanently kill the enemy. Um, they're not always as fast because, like, times... or No, it's the other way around. Killing is faster, but noisier and more risky and then of course knocking someone out takes more time and you risk getting spotted by someone else but it's non-lethal um, and you can hide the body immediately and it makes all it makes a absolutely no noise so you really have to weigh your options like what you want to do in that in that situation so I was pretty underwhelmed with Dishonored the first time I played it and I, I it's a, it's a kind of a short game and so I picked it up played it I think I rented it from Redbox, and then I returned it immediately after I finished it, and I was just like, well, it was all right, I don't really care. I did, you know, end up playing Brigmore Witches, because I was like, well, you know, I, it kind of like, like all the arcane games, this is the arcane syndrome I was talking about. Every time I play an arcane game, the first time I finish it, I think, what's the big deal? Who cares? I was just like, yeah, it's clear that they like Looking Glass, it wasn't as good as a Looking Glass game, it was kind of shallow, it was a bit short, and, you know, I, I'm done with it, right? But then it kind of stays in your mind. And I was like, you know, that Dishonored game had some cool stuff in it. There was some pretty cool level design. And, you know, maybe I didn't use that. I didn't I didn't really try out that power very much. Or I didn't really check for, you know, a different path to try and get to the enemy. I went, I went this way, but maybe I could have taken the window on the left. Or maybe I could have um, gone in through the front door, you know, using like an invisibility uh, power or something like that. Or maybe I could have turned into a fish and gone in, t you know, through the sewers. And so it kind of, you know, got stuck with me, but, you know, it was still never my favorite. And um, same thing happened with Dishonored 2. First time I played it, I was like, well, I finished it, who cares? And same thing with Prey. I played Prey the first time, and I was just like, eh, it's a pretty substandard shooter with the sort of scarcity-style resource management of the original System Shock and Bioshock. Um, and it was frustrating and hard. And overly long. And... Every single one of those games, I have revisited, and then I try something different. And then I revisit again, and I try something different. And I revisit again, and I try something different. And then I realize, wow, this is actually a phenomenal game. I just had different expectations going in. And, and the other thing you have to keep in mind about arcane games, one of the reasons Dishonored 1 is so freaking short is that it's meant for you to replay. It was one of the first games, like stealth games I played like that, with a mission select. Because they're like, yeah, go back, replay it. 
I think it was one of the first two to, to implement a, a new game plus. Where it's just like, yeah, go back with all your powers. You know, try out your powers on the first mission. Go crazy. And um, so Arcane... This is what I call Arcane Syndrome. And now this is why I think... Um, I'm, I'm totally against pre-ordering and buying things when they immediately come out, except for very specific, like Far Cry I'll do it with, but even then I'm just kind of skeptical sometimes. Uh, but I think I'm just going to become sort of a fanboy for Arcane and just buy what they make immediately because every single one of their games, I play it, I, I don't hate it, but I'm just underwhelmed, and then I play it again, you know, maybe several months or a year later, and then I play it again and I play it again, and then it becomes this seemingly endless sandbox of possibilities and fun and uh, an amazing experience and I find things that I never thought I would find before and that does remind me of like playing like Thief 2 where even to this day there's probably stuff in Thief 2 I've never seen before or discovered even though I've played the game a million times and have really tried to find every secret. Um, the other interesting thing I want to say about Dishonored is that it, yeah I think it's a terrible spiritual successor to Thief, right? Like, because the stealth doesn't work super well. And most people who have played it will, will recognize that one of the things that works best in the game is the combat system and the, and the open-ended level design and the fact that they give you all these powers to be able to really do things in so many different ways. You can, you can get to your target in so many different ways. Um, you can go non-lethal, you can go lethal, you can, you can um, use the verticality of the levels and the rooftops to not get seen and then like you know just go guns blazing when you get there um, you can make tons of noise you can be very stealthy uh, you can kill people with accidental kills more importantly you can literally play every dishonored well I don't know about every I don't know what no yeah you can play every dishonored game 100% non-lethal including kill targets um, and I think that thematically one of the, the sort of interesting things about the, the non-lethal approach to Dishonored, especially in Dishonored 2 and Death of the Outsider, is sometimes the non-lethal option is arguably more cruel and more sinister than just killing them. Like the genius inventor, who clearly his greatest possession is his intelligence and his mind. You literally turn into a drooling zombie. So he's still alive, but he's like a vegetable now. And that is just, that is just evil. You know, it would be more humane, I think, to kill him. But it's like, oh, I guess you're a paragon of virtue because you didn't, you know, slit his throat. Um, but so in talking about how the sword play and the powers and combining, you know, powers and the level design and verticality and and the fact that Arcane put in hundreds of simulated systems into the game means that it is just a sandbox for chaos and player creativity and fun. And this is where the game absolutely shines. And this is where it gets elevated above a kind of not great knockoff of Thief to its own thing, which is just like almost not perfection but just genius and it really is a showcase of emergent gameplay when you start pushing all the systems to the limit when you start pushing all like taking advantage of all the exploits that are not really exploits in the sense of like you're breaking the game's engine like forcing it to do things it's not supposed to you are doing things that the game engine is a hundred percent comfortable with it is totally fine um, the rules are there and they're, 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 you're not breaking any rules of the simulation or the game engine you are just exploiting what is possible because of all these simulated systems and I'm gonna spice in some footage uh, one of the things that got me really back into Dishonored was this player his name is stealth gamer br i'm going to uh splice in some footage and credit him here he uh i assume it's a he so i don't know they are um probably one of the best players of the game in the world and they just really showcase that like for example he'll do things like kill a guard right throw his body over the ledge, pick up a body that he's supposed to transport down to the ground, freeze time, jump on the body that he threw over the railing mid-air, um, and then put the body that's on his shoulders 
into midair and then drop to the ground and then like kill one of the guys and then shut up set up two crossbow bolts in frozen time in midair to headshot the two guys on the ground who are shooting at him and then he'll unfreeze time and then uh the two guys that he sent the crossbow bolt at will get shot in the head he'll catch the body of the person he's trying to exfiltrate and then uh, the body of the guard that he initially threw over the railing will hit the last guy who's about to land a blow on him and knock him out or kill him. And it's like, only in Dishonored is there this level of simulation and these many systems to uh, force to interact with. And it's like I talked about earlier, this idea of like setting up the chess pieces and of a, of a, of a simulated game and then just saying like, go, just, just, and just watch the chaos ensue. Um, but it, it it's chaotic and it's crazy, but it never really breaks the rules of the its own game world either. And you can do just amazing things. And he does things like um, guards will be chasing after him, and he will start sliding. And as he's sliding, he'll put a, a trip mine underneath a table. And so then, as the guard runs towards him, gets close to the table, uh, he'll trip the trip mine and die. You know. And he does things like. Um, Another thing he showcases is that there is an incredible degree of depth to the swordplay in Dishonored. I thought it was all pre-baked and I thought it was all uh, pre-animated, and it sort of is, but the issue, or the, the thing about it is, is that depending on where you aim your cursor, when you're sword fighting you can decapitate, so you have complete control over whether you want to decapitate someone, dismember them, cut them down the middle, you can even pick up their body parts and start throwing them at enemies, throw those enemies off guard, also as soon as you break someone's guard you can go in for an immediate kill, and you can determine what that kill is, if it's going to be a body kill, if you're going to lop off one of their extremities and then chop off their head, uh, if you're going to cut off one of their legs, you have complete control over that. I th I used to think it was randomized, but that's just because I don't have the tactile control to aim the cursor in the short amount of time you have to do those things in game. But there's just an incredible amount of detail. Another thing that this player showcases is that, um, like in most games, if you shoot a bullet or you shoot, well, a bullet maybe, but if you shoot like a crossbow bolt or an arrow into the sky, well, in order to reduce the amount of redundant game objects in the world, what will happen is it once it reaches a certain elevation on the map on the Z-axis, uh, the game will just despawn the item, right? And the, it may not even be a, a total physics object either, maybe a particle effect or something like that. In this game, things like arrows, things like bullets, they are all physics objects and they do not leave the map. Once the world is set, anything you do in the world is pretty much permanent, you know? So... One thing that he'll do is he'll he'll be like on the other side of the map, right? And he'll just aim a crossbow at the sky and shoot it. He'll go through a whole, you know, five second montage of just, you know, absolutely slashing to bits anyone in his way. And then the last guy to come up to him will start running towards him, pull out his pistol to shoot uh, the player. And then that crossbow bolt that he shot at the very beginning of this rampage will come back down and hit the guy in the head because Dishonored does not despawn the item just because, well, I guess it's too far in the air to do anything. No, it will arc, and he can actually mortar people's positions because everything that goes up will come down in the game. And it's just fantastic. It's really fantastic, and I'm sure that the designers never really end, because the crossbows take for, the, the hang time is insane, because they really travel uh, really far in the into the atmosphere of the map. I'm not sure that Arcane um, was expecting people to be able to shoot crossbow bolts straight up into the air and then come down on targets at precise points and kill them that way. But they also didn't prevent the players from doing that because it's all simulated. The crossbow bolt is a physics object and it will have, you know, basic Newtonian physics applied to it when shot up and it will come down based on gravity, um, based on the level of elevation of the shot and anything, it will come down. And so. There's all these things in the game that he, this player exploits to just have insane fun. And I'm gonna, I'm spicing whatever footage I can to just showcase the, the crazy, awesome um, fun. And if you watch this footage, you will become so motivated and excited to be like, wow, I need to boot up Dishonored again and just start playing. 
Yeah, remember I said before, uh, immersive sim design can kind of fork down two paths. You either have the one path that's like Thief or Ultima Underworld, which is really trying to create an incredibly immersive experience. You want the player to get totally lost in the game world, to believe that it's a real place. And the reason that the player will start experimenting with systems and stuff like that is because they will be trying to... The believability of the game world um, as a real place will encourage them to to use whatever tools or use whatever systems are in the game world at their disposal to play in a way that they want to. But those things are not there to give the player a sense of choice necessarily. They're there to make the experience more immersive and feel more real. And then you have the other avenue of immersive sim game design, which is just to give the player... It, the, the focus is not necessarily pure the pure immersion it's about giving the player an incredible amount of choice and freedom and i think dishonored really kind of straddles both worlds because arcane design does create these incredibly sort of immersive worlds although i will say they they kind of lean more toward the side of just absolute player choice and dishonored really showcases that the last thing i'm going to say about dishonored that's very interesting is that while it is a, a terrible spiritual successor to thief what a lot of people may not know is that when Thief was in its early stages of development, the reason it's called Thief the Dark Project is that in its early stages of development, it was supposed to be a game called Dark Camelot and then was changed to the Dark Project. And it was supposed to be about this, um, this sort of backwards dark interpretation of Arthurian legend where King Arthur was actually a ruthless despot. And... The game was supposed to basically be a, a sword fighting simulation and they wanted to be able to simulate first person sword combat in such a way where the player had an incredible amount of control over how they fought people in sword combat. So blocking, parrying, where they could strike the opponent, you know. Uh, if they saw an opening maybe on like the shoulder or they saw an opening in the center because the, they were winding up an attack you would try and get an equip jab or a quick stab or slashing across the neck because they have their sword guard too low or things like that and uh, but you know of course the enemies could do the same to you so you had to be careful about angle of attack of the enemy and being able to block at the right times and things like that and they said they were experimenting with a lot of different systems and they just couldn't get it right um, but you know, sort of senior designers and, and especially people like Paul Narath, they liked the general setting, they liked the general vibe, and um, because they were trying to make the game not just entirely about sword combat, there was, I think, missions where you didn't have a weapon and you were trying to sneak into parts of a castle or something. And I think Paul Narath really loved, and other people on the team really loved the idea of just a pure stealth game. And he said, well, why don't we play with more of this? And since they weren't really getting anywhere with the sword combat, they, they didn't have any systems they were super happy with, they started delving more into the stealth part. And so Dark Camelot became the Dark Project. And then when they decided, oh, you know what would be a great game is a game based around a thief. That would use stealth all the time. And then, of course, it became Thief the Dark Project. So while Dishonored is, in my opinion, a terrible spiritual successor to Thief, I think it is honestly a great interpretation of the original design philosophy and original design principles behind Dark Camelot being a sword fighting simulator because when you watch a real expert play Dishonored you realize the depth to the sword combat in the game there is so much going on and so many things to exploit and if you get really good at it you can hold your own against two or three or four guys in a sword fight if you block at the right time, if you parry, if you watch for people to uh, open up their guard just a little bit because maybe they're trying to attack or maybe they're trying to move or maybe they're trying to pull their pistol out. You couple that with the fact that you have all these crazy powers like freezing time and possessing enemies and you know one of the one of the common kills that this guy loves to do, the stealth gamer BR is he will he will get into combat with a bunch of guys, he'll kill maybe one of them, he'll 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 kind of toy with another like a cat with a mouse you know, with its prey, and then he'll wait for one of the officers to pull their pistol, and then at the exact right moment, he will um, freeze time as the bullet is coming out of the barrel of the, the, the pistol. He'll possess the officer that shot the round, 
and then he will put the officer in the path of the bullet and then um, depossess the officer and then unfreeze time and then bam, the, the, the officer has shot themselves in the face. And Dishonored is just amazing for having those level of systems. And it's a little bit more, in my opinion, closer to something like I Divine Cybermancy in terms of just absolute balls to the wall player freedom and player choice and player expression versus trying to sell this like highly immersive experience. Um, but that's not a bad thing, so it's on that sort of other side of the um, immersive sim sort of design philosophy. And uh, I would highly recommend Dishonored to anyone. And I would say, you know, really, you should really start playing and, and mastering as many of the systems as possible. Master the sword combat, master the traversal uh, mechanics like the blink ability and things like that, and master the powers, get a feel for how they work, what, what you can do with them, what you can't do with them, how you can manipulate objects in the environment. Um, learn, learn tricks, like one of the tricks that this guy uses a lot is if you throw something, I mean, think about it in real life too, this does help with immersion. Um, if you're in a sword fight with someone and you throw a whiskey glass at their head, yeah, they're probably going to be stunned for a second with a face full of glass and probably in a little bit of pain, and their guard is going to be down. So one one common trick he'll use is if a, if a guard is trying to lock swords at them, he'll just throw something at their face, they'll be staggered for two seconds, and he'll just come in for the kill and just completely annihilate them. Um, so yeah, Dishonored, definitely an important addition to the Immersive Sim franchise. I think... The thing is, is it's got an identity crisis, so I would rather sell this to you as a game that is like a sword fighting and, and chaos, whatever sort of simulator with lots of like sandboxy kind of fun, rather than a stealth game and a, a thief um, successor. Moving on, the next game on this list included in this sort of compendium of, of immersive sims we're going to be talking about is Bioshock Infinite, and let's just get this out of the way. Bioshock Infinite is not actually an immersive sim. And were I a stronger person of more moral conviction, right, I would definitely put this, because I'm, I'm doing a neck, I'm, after I do this uh, comprehensive list of immersive sims, I'm going to do another list of honorable mentions. For example, something like Far Cry 3 or Metal Gear Solid 5 would definitely fit on the honorable mentions list because they have that player choice driven systemic gameplay, but they're missing some of the core design principles of the immersive sim um, ultimately. So I really want to do a video about that. And this would probably be more comfortable in that list, but much like a kid who had a straight 2.0 or 1.5 GPA out of high school who winds up at Harvard because his dad is well connected, Bioshock Infinite's um, dad, Bioshock, and then of course its grandfather System Shock are very well connected in the immersive sim field, so Bioshock Infinite makes the list, and um, yeah, I'm gonna agree, I don't think it should be there. I don't think it's earned it. I don't. I don't think it's uh, right that it's there necessarily, but it is there. And I'm, I, I, like I said, I don't have the, the willpower to not include it on the list. Um, and I also, I just want to talk about it too. I want to talk about Bioshock Infinite. So yeah, Bioshock Infinite is typically included on on lists of immersive sims purely because of its pedigree and nothing else. It does not. It actually betrays most of the design principles of immersive sims. So where Bioshock was really starting to kind of show some worrying traits like a lack of a manipulatable inventory, although you could store things. So you could store things like junk to use in crafting materials. You could store med kits. You could store Eve hypos. You couldn't store other things that you might want to use later, like um, as much ammo as you want. You know, um, there is a maximum amount of ammo you can carry for every gun in the game. Whereas if you want to in Deus Ex or System Shock 2 or System Shock 1, you can just stock up on ammo for, for just keep adding ammo to your inventory. And you may not have med kits and you may not have uh, healing item, or uh, that, that is a healing item. You may not have combat stims and you may not even have other weapons, but you've got a ton of ammo for that one weapon. Um, in Bioshock you couldn't do that, but there was this, there was this like hidden inventory in the game that you couldn't access. Um, 
So you would just constantly be picking stuff up and then later you could use it for crafting or you could pick up med kits and, and have a, a store of med kits, but you couldn't access it. Um, you could just use a med kit if you wanted to. Well, Bioshock Infinite, for starters, does away completely with uh, an inventory of any kind. And most egregiously, com by comparison to Bioshock 1, you can't even store extra med kits or um, they're called salts in this game. So you can't store extra bottles of salts. And this is incredibly frustrating because what this means is in a lot of combat encounters, and this is this is most prevalent on Bioshock's 1999 mode, which is a very, very poor attempt to pander to System Shock 2 fans and say, well, maybe if you wanted it to be more like System Shock 2, you should play like this. All it does is increase massively the scarcity of items in the game. That's pretty much all it does. And that sucks because that you know System Shock 2 isn't necessarily about scarcity. It's about a lot of other things. And so you know I thought maybe 1999 mode would be like, well you know I made all these concessions for the publisher, but here's an actual inventory, um, and here's the you know the necessity to actually stick with a build and things like that. No, it doesn't really work like that. It's just they just re the enemies do a lot more damage. They take a lot more ammo to take down. Um, and there's a lot less ammo and pickups in the world. That's pretty much it for 1999 mode. Um, so yeah, it, what it means not having an inventory in Bioshock Infinite is that if you get into a firefight and you get low on health, um, you can't like you can't carry the extra med kit with you. So what you got to do is either hope that you can get through the combat encounter and kill the enemy. And then run back to where you found the health, or just stop fighting altogether to run back and pick up the health kit. What it also means too is that, in the if you're used to playing immersive sims, you, you will accidentally be picking up stuff all the time. Um, also, another thing that really sucks is you cannot selectively tell your character which things you want to pick up. Like, so if you open up a barrel, for example, there's three inventory slots. When you open up a barrel, and it'll be three different things. If you want to, if you want to pick up even one of those things, you have to pick up all three at the same time. This flies directly in the face of any concept of immersive sim game design. Now, Bioshock One did this as well, but it because there were other parts of the game that allowed for more player freedom and choice. It was not that big of an issue and because your player could have a bit of an inventory. So the only things that your character would auto consume in Bioshock 1 was basically food items. Alcohol and food. Um, and cigarettes. But in this game, that could be anything. That could be Extra Eve. Where, now I will say this, if you are at full uh, salt or full health, sometimes the game won't auto consume the items. But still, it's really frustrating, and it, it makes really no sense other than the fact that the game is pretty easy, even on 1999 mode. It's not terribly difficult. So, I can see them saying, like, well, if you could carry on extra items, then it's just too easy. Well, it's just like, okay, then tweak your difficulty. Don't, don't, you know, add this, you know, really frustrating mechanic that, that co totally betrays the, the principles that the previous games were designed on. It's so dumb. In addition to that, there are a lot of linear sections to the game. You have to do things in a certain way. You have to hit certain story beats, you know. Um, I guess you could say Bioshock 1 was sort of uh, guilty of this as well. But, I don't know, it just feels like a, a much more linear affair. Whereas Bioshock 1 really dropped you into these like mini open worlds. And you were given like a list of objectives, but you could, you could explore a little bit if you wanted to. You could try and... Um, you know, gain some atom before you completed the objective because you're like, well, maybe there's some tough enemies down the road, so I'll I'll beef myself up with some atom um, first by taking on the big daddies and and liberating the little little sisters so I can go to the buy some more upgrades. Um, and there was much more of an emphasis on just general explore excuse me exploration of the level levels as well. But in Bioshock Infinite, basically, it's just a bunch of sort of like set pieces. It's like walking through like a like like those sort of like little fakey mock-up uh, towns in Disneyland, like the Western Town and like the Adventure Town with like the the tiki huts and things like that. It's like walking through one of those and it's just like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's a little set piece. Oh, that's a little um, like animation I'm meant to watch. And then you just go into a combat arena. 
and then you go back into like sort of a linear um, bottleneck and then to a uh, to a bit of story progression all right so the only things left of the immersive sim pedigree are the fact that obviously you pick your upgrades they're not just but even then you know um, yeah I guess you could say make the same argument about Bio Bioshock 1 but Bioshock 1 started opening up new powers and new abilities um, you know it really sort of spider webbed out at the middle of the game so then you could really pick and choose what you wanted um, and of course the gene tonic slot you only have so many gene tonic slots so even though you're picking them up all in a, in a sequential order you can kind of fit a build for yourself and that sort of happens in this game as well with the character's gear which is the same thing um, but in terms of powers you're offered very few powers at the beginning of the game and you you do pick a ton of them up just by playing through the world and a lot of them are incredibly story and plot relevant and so you just have to get them when you get them in the in the chronological uh, point in the story you don't just get to pick like this is my build these are the these are the powers I want to use a lot um, this is how I want to play the other thing that this game really stupidly does is give you the sort of halo-esque two weapon limit which really makes no sense and you can sort of tell uh, especially playing on 1999 mode you can sort of tell that the game isn't really designed around this there's definitely a lot of sections where it would really help to have like a crowd control gun that does like a lot of, um, you know, like a full auto something or something like that, um, and then like maybe a backup pistol if you're in the process of reloading everything else, but you need to just put some lead down range, you know, have a backup pistol, and then keep something heavy um, on you at all times so that you can, um, you know, take out heavy enemies and stuff like that, like um, the handyman or, or things like that. Um, and then maybe have a, a long distance rifle, you know, um, something with a scope that, that zooms in just a little bit so you can start dealing with enemies that are a little bit farther away. You can tell that the game is really designed around having all those options, but with a two weapon limit, you never have those options. And so you basically just have to find guns that are just jacks of all trades. Um, so basically you'll just have one gun, right, that you're going to use for everything. And then you've got a heavy gun in case you run into some stiff resistance, like a handyman or something. So it's typically going to be something like the hand cannon and a rocket launcher, or the hand cannon and the the Gatling gun, or the carbine and the Gatling gun. And it, it's pretty much just going to be those two or three or four weapons throughout the entire game. You're not going to get to play. There, I've played Bioshock Infinite maybe five or six or seven times, and I, there's still weapons I've never touched because of that stupid two weapon limit. In addition to that you have to there's an upgrade system and especially on harder difficulties like 99 mode you have to apply upgrades to your weapons so that they start doing significant damage to enemies well if you've been spending a lot of money and upgrade points on upgrading like the carbine and then all of a sudden you hit a patch of, of combat arenas where nobody's using it well then you're screwed and you gotta be picking up weapons that aren't upgraded and that you're not used to dealing with and all of this other crap and it just makes no sense and I don't know why they got rid of the, the weapon system, the sort of Half-Life-esque weapon system from Bioshock 1 where you just get all the weapons in the game and you can choose what you want for each encounter. Or go back to the old school style of System Shock 2 where it's like you have an inventory and you've got to determine what, what you have space for, what you're going to be using more. But no, they didn't do that and so that's another big issue in the game. Um, the game does have some maps that are sort of open-worldy, but they're very sort of light on the, the open design aspect. Yeah, there's some things you can explore here or there, but it's typically only like you open a door with the lockpick and then there's maybe one or two rooms inside that have some extra stuff. It's not like you can find stuff that, that you know, is not really part of the plot and you can really sort of like go on this like huge tangent in this in this opposite direction and find all this interesting stuff and and uh, find all this interesting gear no it's not like that at all it's it's pretty much you just got to go through the prescribed paths and there might be a few hidden rooms here or there so it basically stripped out all the immersive sim stuff from the game the only thing that like i said is immersive sim anymore is just you can choose what upgrades to buy for your weapons you can choose which plasmids you want to buy which ones you want to upgrade um, if you want health upgrades, it's, oh no, no, the health upgrades and stuff, that's a totally different thing. That's just secret hunting. So even that. Um, 
The only thing I would say is sort of in line with immersive sims is the fact that combat is pretty open-ended. Once they do throw you into a combat arena, it is really, you know, they try and give you some options so you can sort of play the way you like. Um, it's a good idea to use a healthy amount of plasmids in conjunction with your weapons because weapons just don't do that much damage. And then of course, uh, Elizabeth, the, the character Elizabeth in the game, she is this like multi-dimensional creature and she's able to op open up tears in uh, space-time between realities and basically bring things in that don't exist in this reality that will exist in other realities. Um, but of course not, not crazy realities like the planet Zognorth or whatever when they can bring in like a plasma rifle. No, it, it's like uh, parallel realities that are like the same exact thing as ours except in that universe you have black hair instead of brown, you know. Um, and so she'll be able to bring in things like, oh, here's here's like a dump of ammo, or oh, here's a here's a rocket launcher, or oh, here's a, a piece of cover, or oh, here's a hook you can use to get to high ground. So you can sort of start playing with a lot of systems in the game, and, and the plasmids, I actually think, some people complain, I think the plasmids are kind of fun to play with, and they all have their purpose. And on 1999 mode, you really realize that they have their purpose. Um, each weapon has their purpose, and there is something to be said for you know, the two weapon limit, while it sucks, does sort of force you to play more aggressively. Like, you'll have to do things like use a lot of offensive or a lot of stun plasmids to get out into the middle of a combat arena, pick up a weapon you need, and then maybe retreat to cover or gain elevation, then maybe use something like a rocket launcher or a sniper rifle to start picking off some of the enemies. Um, and of course, you know, some of the areas like uh, Battleship Bay and things like that, they have sort of off the beaten path places to explore. Um, and there is a lot of great uh, world building through conversations you'll overhear from NPCs, audio diaries, and then of course just environmental t storytelling. I think one thing that Bioshock Infinite does really well, that's sort of part and parcel of Immersive Sims, is environmental storytelling. Um, there is a ton of it in the game. If you really pay attention, there is a ton of depth and detail to the environment. Um, to little story bits, to little uh, uh, character development bits, um, hidden all throughout the game, and you can you can discover so many little kind of like unique and and hidden not places because they're a lot of in, in plain sight, but hidden uh, stories and hidden hidden elements of the world, and it is so packed with visual detail and and lore detail that it is worth playing through multiple times and checking different things out. Um, and the game gives you this illusion of choice too, uh, which thematically plays into the story of, you know, sort of the theme of constants and variables where uh, the game will ask, Elizabeth will be like, do you want me to wear this one or this one? And then sh she'll be like, do you want to go left or right? And then they'll ask, do you want to go heads or tails or something like that? And you feel like, oh, okay, maybe if I play the game another time, I'll get an alternate ending. But no, the, the whole point of the game is that regardless of the, the variables, that you change throughout the gameplay, there are certain constants in in different timelines of parallel realities that cannot be changed. Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but that's kind of part of the story of the game. But it just ties into the fact that, again, it is a very linear story that's always going to play out the same way every time. The same can be said of Bioshock 1, but Bioshock 1 had really open-ended level design for a lot of its levels that just let you explore in whatever order you wanted, discover little side objectives in whatever order you wanted, and um, give you a large degree of customization for how to deal with the threats in the game world. Um, and there was a lot of uh, systems in the game too. You know, for example, like, Bioshock Infinite feels like a game that constantly reacts to you because you're on a roller coaster ride, you know? It's, it's being on, like, a scary roller coaster ride where the monsters jump out at you at the exact pre precise moments, um, and as, as you're cart goes away you can hear the hydraulics retracting them back into the wall and it completely destroys the illusion right whereas Bioshock 1 is it's just a simulation they drop you into the world and this before you enter the room and the splicers know you're there there you do get this impression that they are doing they are living in the ecosystem of rapture on their own regardless of you um, you are an extra stimulus put in that they will respond to, but they're already doing their own things before you get there. Columbia doesn't feel like that. Columbia just feels like sort of 
empty and superficial until you go past certain trigger points and then enemies will just pop out from everywhere who are who are told to just kill you um and even like the handyman and stuff like that it's not like you know it's not like the big daddies where you see them all around and the decision to get into combat is made by the player and the big daddies and the little sisters they're doing their own thing so it feels like a real world because of the simulation of all the ai um kind of going about their business and creating the ecosystem of Rapture, um, you are just another element put into that ecosystem. Whereas Bioshock Infinite feels like a roller coaster meant to put you on a thrill ride, which it essentially is. So that, you know, I think Bioshock Infinite is a fantastic game. I think the shooting is super fluid and super fun. I think in terms of like total fun package, the shooting, for example, and gameplay is more fun and, and thrilling than Bioshock 1 because it's designed to be. Um, and I, I thought the first time I ever played it, I thought the story was really, really powerful. I loved the twist at the end. Um, I loved the emotional component, too. Uh, I loved the character development and character arcs of Elizabeth and Booker and how they played off each other and their chemistry. Um, I loved a lot of the themes in the game, especially showing that the, you know, the Vox Populi, you know, were supposed to be champions of the people and, and everything like that, but they could be just as ruthless and, and shitty as the people that they overthrew. Um, I thought the setting was amazing, but if you actually look at early E3 demos and then late E3 demos of what Bioshock Infinite, it looked a lot more like an immersive sim. And it seems that one of the biggest qualms that I and I think most fans of the Shock family have with Infinite is that it's very clear from interviews that Ken Levine was so enraptured in his own story, so in love with the plot and, and making sure that the development of Booker and Elizabeth's relationship worked the way he wanted to and he got to tell the story that he wanted to that i think he sacrificed a lot of the gameplay um, i don't think it was all his fault i'm sure there was pressure from the publisher to ship early and he was like if we ship early we can only do this and they were said like well whatever it's a shooter who cares um but i think it was also partially his fault for for you know not saying like hey we have all these great systems we have all these great things we want to do for the game but he was like no we so the game definitely feels more like it's just there to tell the story rather than there's a great story attached to a fantastic game like in bioshock one and it's just really depressing to i don't want to say depressing it's disappointing to go back and watch the potential that this game had to be as good if not better than Bioshock 1 because of all the interesting systems and all the interesting gameplay elements that they were looking to add in. My favorite one, if you can find it, is the earliest E3. It's more of a proof of concept and it's the one where the sky hook is in a little hook. It looks like a tiny little wheel that just goes into the track. Uh, it's the one where the guy is by himself grandstanding to no one and then he shoots the crows at uh, at uh, Stephen Russell, so they have the voice of Garrett as Booker in that one. Um, it's the one where Booker walks into the bar and they're like, we're closed, and they shoot him, and then he uses the telekinesis to literally lift the gun up and then also fire the gun without grabbing it at the shopkeeper. Um, and it's the one where uh, Elizabeth, I think, a, oh no, one of, instead of the, the shock plasmid where you just shoot a bolt at someone, you, he actually like summoned like storm clouds and then hit them with the electricity bolt and it chain shocked like multiple enemies. Um, and the one where Elizabeth was able to use like this overpowered telekinesis to like grab all the bullets being fired at them and all of the metal around them into this like giant ball of slag and like hurl it at the enemies. I mean it's just really cool all of the stuff they were showing off. And even the E3 demos they did later made it look like the, there was a lot more open First of all, the levels were much bigger, much bigger, and then there was a lot more open world design where there was a lot, a lot of things to discover and see, and and um, and I also like the fact that there was one of the strengths of Bioshock Infinite is that there are several places that you go in the game where you're not immediately identified as an enemy, um, so you're surrounded by you know civilians but also military and they don't know you're the enemy yet so you can just kind of like see what the city is like before the big fall and um, 
it seemed like there was more, even more of that in Bioshock Infinite, where you could choose to, you know, maintain your cover, you could choose to uh, maybe help someone out by, by blowing your cover, and then you'd have to fight a bunch of people, and I don't know, it just, the, it was a game that showed so much promise, and yet the, the actual thing that we were delivered was just awful. Not awful, but like just, it just missed the mark in so many ways in terms of the potential and possibilities for gameplay and everything like that. And it, it remains, I think, a great game, but it, it's, always, it, it's always left a sour taste in my mouth. As good as it is, it has left a sour taste in my mouth because of um, what it could have been had they actually delivered the things that they showed off in early concept stuff in an E3. Uh, they definitely trimmed the game down substantially. Um, and of course, it really just stopped being an immersive sim and just became more of like a extremely story-driven shooter that had, I mean, compared to a lot of shooters, like a military shooter, it has incredible depth. It's got depth in terms of like all the different powers you can use, all the different ways you can sort of um, engage in combat and, and the ways that you can direct each combat encounter, but compared to, you know, real immersive sims, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's incredibly shallow. So I think it, it rightfully gets a lot of disappointment from fans. The one thing I don't understand is, where, is fans of Bioshock say it's a bad game, because it's not. It's a phenomenal game. It's a really, really good game. It's just a disappointing sequel to Bioshock and a disappointing um, progeny of the System Shock franchise as well. So, Moving on, this is another outlier, and this is one of the reasons I love this list. This is an outlier that really helped. This list is great at not only expanding your concept of what immersive sims are, but also introducing you to new immersive sims that you wouldn't play. I think a lot of people who get into immersive sims, they just play Deus Ex, Thief, System Shock, and then maybe Dishonored, and then Prey, and that's it. That's all they play. Um, and, you know, it's like it doesn't have to be arcane and... Iron Storm slash Looking Glass who designed these games. There are other people making immersive sims. Some great, not some not so great. Well, this one's an outlier, but unfortunately it's a not so great one, but there's a there's a major caveat with that. So this is called Consortium. Uh, Consortium takes place in a sort of alternate reality, and sort of the premise of Consortium is that the way that they create this sort of immersive world that's different than our reality is the idea is they're using a piece of software that connects you and hijacks the mind of someone in another reality or the body of someone in another reality. And so you're playing as you, a person in your own reality, but controlling someone in an alternate reality. And in this alternate reality, there is the consortium. The consortium, I, I guess, is sort of like a militant arm of a, of a, of a world government. And consortium sets the stage for all sorts of political, um, in international turmoil um, because of this this one world government trying to to contain order and you know there's various things like different terrorist attacks that you guys are trying to thwart and then you have made enemies of course and so throughout the course of the game so the game takes place on this large like sort of futuristic Boeing 747 right and you're given this like high-tech armor because um, you're a member of the consortium and and the game is is incredibly story oriented and incredibly character oriented so um, basically throughout the course of the game uh, things happen like like you get attacked by a terrorist group and then boarded and you have to choose how to deal with the, the borders and everything like that and uh, what happens is is sometime after the terrorist attack or sometime before it the the planes defenses have gone down And there's a there's a saboteur and a hacker on board So the main point of the game is you are about to embark on a mission because there is a large terrorist faction holding this entire Building hostage and making demands and so you as a member of the consortium are going to be sent in as a sort of one-man uh, peacekeeping army to deal with the situation and put down the terrorist however you can um, but your primary concern is to take care of the saboteur on board. And so what this is going to entail is you doing a... So it is definitely an immersive sim that goes more for a 
interacting with all the people of the world. Now one of the brilliant things about Consortium is that if you want to make a game where you have to get into lengthy conversations with people to learn about them, learn about their past, determine if they're lying about stuff, determine if they're loyal to your cause, uh, determine just their general personality traits, and maybe even forge friendships, that's a lot of talking, that's a lot of dialogue, and if you're going to play a game like Deus Ex in the Hong Kong level that's populated with, I don't know, 200 NPCs, that's going to take a long time, but probably more than that, probably like three or four hundred NPCs. It's going to take forever to talk to everybody and get a sense of everybody and everything like that. Well, what Consortium does is you can talk to every single person in the game, but since it's set on an airplane, there's a limited number of people. And so this allows for a great degree of depth in terms of character development, in terms of conversation um, options and conversation choices. And you can really screw yourself out of being able to make educated guesses about who the saboteur might be, or you can really screw yourself out of particular clues if you're not very careful about how you talk to people. And you as the player have to get a sense of the best way to talk to these people by getting to know them. And it of course makes the plot feel a lot more engaging because you start to know all of these people, you know their personalities, you know their history and you may even start to uh, like them um, as a person you might be like well I really like this guy he's pretty dope also like most immersive sims um, almost every little object in the environment is a 3d physics object and um, your suit uses a special energy that it can convert to ammunition or it can be used to create nanites to repair the suit should you take damage and things like that so another thing that you can do is basically any piece of junk in the environment can be converted into nanites um, with this sort of beam that comes out of your suit so that it adds sort of a function to a lot of this the sort of miscellaneous physics objects in the world um, and there'll be a variety of side quests like for example ever since the hack in the morning there's like all these systems that don't seem to be working on the ship so one of the side quests is just seeing if you can find all the malfunctioning um, systems like flickering lights or doors that don't open and things like that um, additionally, the game gives you a large degree of choice for how you're going to deal with certain people, if you're going to be aggressive with them, if you're going to be nice, if you're going to befriend them. Um, when you're boarded by the enemies, you're given the choice to kill every last one of them and spare the leader, kill every last one of them and kill the leader, um, uh, or convince them to leave, or trick the leader into um, surrendering or, or something like that so you're giving a lot of choices and the choices are not just like okay hey here's abc you just press action button b and it'll be done no you have to actually figure out how to do those things too so again one of those immersive sim aspects it's really trying to make this world feel as this is more like down the thief line where it's it's not about giving the player absolute freedom and, and, and a million choices it's about making the world feel real and the way that this uh game creates a very immersive world is simulating what it's like to deal with people and also simulating um, permanent consequence. So like I said, you know, you really have to worry about the consequences of your action in this game, or your actions in this game. Um, you can, I think, save scum, but it's not really in the spirit of what the game is trying to do. Another thing that this game does in terms of um, continuing player immersion is that it doesn't have any cutscenes and it doesn't ever take you out of the player character's body. And even training is done through some sort of like VR type thing. Um, and this game is really trying to simulate, in addition to uh, player consequence in terms of like if you miss certain things, this game is also really trying to simulate the sort of butterfly effect or domino effect of, of minor choices that you might make at different points and how they're going to echo throughout the ship like, or throughout the story. So this game has a, a large sort of uh, story mechanic where a lot of basically everything that you do pretty much will have an effect on the story have an effect on how different characters will treat you have an effect on uh, whether or not it's possible to determine who the saboteur is have an effect on whether or not certain options will be available when you're dealing with the saboteur things like that um, even as simple as like I think there's a wounded cream member at the very beginning of the game uh, when you guys are attacked and it's if because you have multiple things that they're you're asking you to do, so you have to make a decision whether or not you want to try and help her or not. So this, these are the kind of simulations the game does, trying to really simulate, okay, this is the whole experience of what's happening, these are all the characters' motivations, um, and you need to try and treat them like real people, and they're going to be 
simulated real people and that's where the, the the immersion really comes from it's pushing this idea it's a real world real consequences and it's really trying to get you to buy this idea that you are like in bot you are inhabiting the body of someone in this world and, and so all of the choices and things that you're doing are, are having consequences real cons permanent consequences in that world now I didn't really like the game <laughs> I know I'm sort of talking it up is pretty cool, but I didn't really like it. Um, I thought that it it's very short. It can be finished in about an hour and a half, two hours. And it is really disappointing because this game came out a while ago. And it, it honestly, if, if anyone remembers Metal Gear Solid uh, 5 Ground Zeroes, was basically a two hour demo that was the prologue to a 50 or 60 hour Metal Gear Solid 5. And this game is a two-hour demo, which admittedly you have to play. If you're going to play the next game in the series, you have to play this one. But it's just a two-hour prologue to set up the story, characters, and events leading into the next game. And um, spoiler alert, just in case anyone wants to play this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin the ending of this real quick. Um, it's Everything is leading up to you... Um, being inserted via airdrop into this tower that is, I told you, under terrorist control, um, and you're trying to thwart their efforts and, and put down the um, whatever terrorists are there, uh, ideally through non-lethal means, but you know, basically however you can. And the game keeps talking it up and talking it up, and like you have meetings with like your superiors about what you're gonna do and you know what they, you know, what the objectives are and where the enemies are and everything like that. And then of course when you actually get to the tower, the game just ends. In fact, you don't even see the tower. You just airdrop to get to it, and the game just ends on a cliffhanger. And again, it's only two hours, but it's like it's not quite full price. But I think I paid like ten bucks for it or something. Or no, I got it on sale, but I think the the normal price is ten or fifteen bucks, and it's really a ripoff. And there's, if it was a proof of concept to just show people like, hey, this is a cool game world. Hey, this is our interpretation of immersive sims. And hey, we have this whole whole other design document for a game that we want to make. Please help us fund it. Then they should have done a Kickstarter and had this be a demo as part of the Kickstarter for backers or whatever, rather than release it as if it's like a full game on Steam because it most certainly is not. So that is my biggest issue with the game. Now, the, the caveat to this game being something that I think sucks is that I think the world is great, I think the story is great, and guess what? I just recently played a demo of Consortium The Tower, which you can check out right now on Steam. No, so not only so this game runs on the Source Engine and it is terribly optimized. So I, don't, I think I was getting like 25 frames a second on a Source Engine game with graphics that aren't really that great, so it's horribly optimized. But um, the new game isn't terribly well optimized, but it does run better, actually, believe it or not. And it's, it's on Unreal 4, so it looks better, it runs better, it's uh, more stable. And all of the mechanics, because basically, you don't, there's barely any shooting, if at all, in Consortium. But it's like, a, it's like a Deus Ex style shooter where you get guns and things like that. So the fact that you're not using these guns, the fact that they teach you how to repair your armor, but you never need to repair your armor. The fact that they teach you how to... Um, switch between different weapons and equip different weapon mods and then you I don't even if you play it certain a certain way You will never even get a weapon in the game it Just makes no sense But of course I remembered all of these things when I played the demo so playing the demo was like second nature and the demo was awesome and the, and the thing that pisses me off too is the demo for consortium the tower is as long if not longer with more options that showcases more of what the core gameplay of this game is going to be um, And it's just a demo and it's not being billed as a full game yet. Uh, the full game is early access. I don't know how much of the game you can access. I don't know if you can actually complete the story or if there's only a few missions that you can do. And I gotta say, this plays a lot more like Deus Ex. And honestly, it feels like a much um, more faithful... Well, I don't want to say that, but it's a very faithful spiritual successor to Deus Ex, the, the game coming up. And so, do I recommend this game? I kind of have to, sort of backhandedly, because I have to say, like, you know what? I'm really excited for Consortium The Tower. And I think that's, if you're an immersive sim fan, you should be closely following that game and getting geared up to play it. Or just buy the early access right now and support them. I personally don't like early access because I feel like, you know, you play it so much when it's in a shitty state, but you've ruined the whole story for yourself. And then you're a little bit less motivated to play it when, when the final release comes out. So that's my issue with 
early access so i'll probably just wait for the official release but um but yeah if you if you if you have the money and you want to support them yeah just buy the early access and and get involved because i think it's a great project and of course the story in the world that they set up in consortium one is very interesting and i like it and it's incredibly necessary to play consortium one before you play the tower you're not going to have any fucking clue not only how to control the game because there's no tutorial in the tower but you also have no idea what the fuck is going on because literally consortium the tower starts the millisecond after consortium one ends so you have to have some idea you're literally in midair like f falling through midair um so yeah, Consortium, in my opinion, not a great game, but they, a great prelude to a great universe that will result in, I hope, what seems to be a great game in Consortium The Tower. Um, so yes, check it out, and check out Consortium The Tower as well. Next up is another outlier, and that's why I love this list. Um, it's not an unknown game, it's just an outlier for Immersive Sims, but I would say Alien Isolation. Alien Isolation... Um, checks a lot of boxes for immersive sims and it's one of the few immersive sims that is a horror game which is really great uh alien isolation is definitely more down that thief route instead of giving the player tons of choice to create that to to you know and, and tons of freedom like your deus exes and your your i divine cybermancies and your dishonors it's more about okay we really want to make this experience as immersive as possible and the thing that's great about alien isolation is except for a few sort of cutscene bits and theatrical bits at the beginning and end there's very little scripting in the game most of the horror in the game comes from simu ai simulations and it is basically just the the crux of everything about immersive sims um, in addition, uh, I believe most of the objects in the world can be interacted. Um, if not, there's plenty of things to interact with in the world. And um, there's lots of little immersive touches too when you play the game, like being able to take a shower when you first wake up out of the cryopods and play with this and read emails. Tons of the story is um, told through audio logs and emails a la System Shock and System Shock 2, so it definitely has a, a large influence of System Shock. And in fact, when you go to the main plaza, uh, after the first level of the game, you could be forgiven to, of thinking this is not like some sort of updated visual version of some of the levels from System Shock 2. And Alien Isolation does uh, try and give the player a lot of different avenues, and, and again, it's, it's, it, it is more in line with that core immersive sim philosophy, which is that we need to simulate this world as much as possible to create a believable real experience for the player um, and so they give the player a ton of tools and they give the player a ton of different avenues for which to get through all of the different levels of the game now the tools and and the the different things like going through vents or or going down the main thoroughfare or going through um, underneath the floorboards or hiding underneath furniture and stuff like that to in order to traverse it's not because oh well immersive sim design philosophy is just about player choice it's more because well this AI is kind of hard to get around and it's you know it can smell the player it can hear the player it can see the player and it will get very close to finding the player sometimes so we need to give the player a lot of options to get away from it so it's the simulation that is driving the need for multiple avenues of approach and it is also the fact that there are multiple avenues of approach to get through the different obstacles in the game that make the world feel more more real they could have very easily made this game just a haunted house game where it's like you have to go down the corridor and then like either quick time events or like oh you just have to start running you know out outlast style to get away from the the alien just keep running and keep jumping over the obstacles as they come up and that's it no this game is really about just like okay here's an open world here's the alien the alien will go wherever the hell he wants based on his ai simulation and you just have to try to not get a get et as they say you know um it's phenomenal and uh, there's a lot of things too like um uh, exploration is rewarded heavily in the game um finding clues and things like that a la system shock in in diaries to get through uh secret rooms and things and, and hidden paths that you know you're not you don't have to go into 
uh, to accomplish story missions, but you can. The fact that you can do things like change elements in the environment to make it easier to sneak through or to distract the alien, you know, like you can change the fog, you can change the lighting, you can change all sorts of stuff in the room by hacking these panels to change, you know, sort of like Thief, to change the environment to make stealth or make getting through certain parts easier or to help you evade the, the alien. And like Thief, you have thing, you have tools at your disposal to help, not necessarily with stealth, it's not stealth like in Thief, like staying, um, undetected but it's more like distraction based or deterrent based you know eventually you do get weapons and so when you have to fight the robot enemies of the game you can either try and well you can use bombs to try and um, kill them uh, so there's a whole crafting mechanic too as well in um, alien isolation now it has a bit of more of a more rudimentary inventory than I would like for a game like that but it's fine um, so you can craft uh, bombs to deal with the threats, you can craft EMP grenades to deal with the, the aliens, or you can just use your guns to try and deal with them. Um, Molotov cocktails are great against the alien, so you don't want to necessarily use them against the robots, although you can. Um, and then you can use a flamethrower, which is not really, once again, it's not a great offensive weapon, but it is a good way for you, it's a tool to help you, if you, like, there are a lot of timed sections and sections where you just need to get through places fast, and it, it really ratchets the tension up when the alien just, you never know where it's coming from or what it's going to do, but at least you have the flamethrower to try and piss it off or scare it away for a few seconds to try and get the hell out of there. And the game is really good, too, at, a lot like System Shock 1, it, you just never feel safe, because the enemies never stop coming. Even if you put down all the robots in the area, the alien's going to start showing up. So... Like I said, immersion driven through simulation, making the world feel real. I think the save system is there to try and make the world feel a little bit real as well um, and add to the tension. I personally hate the save system. It's one of the reasons I've only played the game in its entirety once and I have started playthroughs three or four times after that. It's a game that I would love to have played many, many times, but it is very intense. It's a very long game and it's very... Um, it can be very frustrating too with the save system so I find myself less inclined to pick it up just because it's like it, it, it demands so much of you it demands a ton of your time it demands a ton of your patience it demands a ton of your courage to just be like alright we're gonna do this we're gonna get through this this level you know and and deal with all that tension and stress and fear um, but of course that's incredibly immersive you do feel like you are trapped on a ship with the alien and the fact that you can't kill it just makes it that much more intense um, and so yeah I think Alien Isolation is an incredible example of how games that wouldn't traditionally be thought of as immersive sims if you actually break them down to their core mechanics and core components you're like oh shit that is an immersive sim <laughs> absolutely in fact I think Alien Isolation is one of the better examples of an immersive sim and I think it's one of the more creative immersive sims as well um, you know, uh, I mentioned earlier how it's it's kind of unique of being a horror immersive sim. I mean, System Shock is as well, but Alien Isolation is a horror immersive sim in a totally different way, where you're dealing with enemies that you absolutely can't kill, and you don't necessarily have like a player build. It's a lot more like Thief in the sense that like okay, like you, and or Bioshock, where it's like all right, you have some control over some of the weapons and um, items that you have so if you're scavenging and crafting enough you can have certain things but you know you really are just like 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 Garrett like you have a certain amount of skills and abilities and things like that and you have some tools at your disposal and you just got to go with it another thing that I love about Alien Isolation is there's very few things that are there to try and take you out of the game world your HUD is incredibly limited you know weapons don't pop up all the time and i think that is more true to real life you know you're not gonna st have you ever tried to hold a, a gun like a rifle like if you've ever been hunting or something like that and you're stalking something holding a rifle up at the ready and and for long periods of time gets incredibly tiring so the way that first person shooters um convey this with the gun just basically right in front of your face the entire time like you would be exhausted so alien isolation is really great in that um, the weapon is holstered or, or pointed towards the ground in a more relaxed position until it's time to aim, and then when you just you just uh, hold down the aim trigger, it'll bring the weapon up quickly. Um, and there's not a ton of HUD elements either in Alien Isolation, and even things like the tracker, you know, in a lazier game or a game less committed to immersion, the tracker would be something that um, 
is just a little mini map thing in the corner and it'll say like oh it's beeping now the alien's coming but the thing about alien isolation is the tracker is an actual thing it's a physical object you have to grab out of your inventory and hold and and as the player much like the map in far cry 2 you have to read it in the game world and that's great another thing that's great is they added a whole other level of simulation for the console releases because there's a built-in mic to like for example the playstation 4 controller so if you're hiding in a in a locker or something and the alien's coming for you if you're breathing too loud or if you're trying to talk to your buddy like oh i hope it doesn't see me the alien will hear you because the the mic input will pick it up and it'll it'll simulate the alien hearing that extra noise that you're making so you have to be extra quiet in the real world uh, sort of an augmented reality part of the game um, in order to hide from the alien. Um, and they, I think the designers have even said that the, the alien can track based on scent and all these other kind of things. So think about this level of simulation and commitment to immersion with the fact that most of the tools and gadgets and stuff like that, yeah, anytime you hack, you have to bring out your hacking tool and actually manipulate the tool to try and hack the thing. It's not, it's not a progress bar and it doesn't take you to a whole separate screen like in Bioshock where you're safe, like I have literally jumped in midair to reach the height to hit the hack button on a security camera in Bioshock, and I assume my character is just stuck in midair, hacking. Time freezes while I do this. Um, and of course, these things are there. They're, the beauty of this is that this this design philosophy isn't just because like, oh, we really like immersive sims and we want to be as committed to this design philosophy as possible. It also benefits the gameplay uh, tremendously because you are now in these really tense moments where it's not just a progress bar and the hacking can take as long the hacking can take really long sometimes if you suck at the mini games to hack and of course you have to be in front of the door with the physical tool and doing the mini game and so uh if you're having trouble performing under pressure and you're you're screwing it up and things like that it just adds to more tension because you know you're exposed and you're like oh i'm not doing this right and again simulating what it'd be like in reality if you had to get a little hacking tool out or you had to rewire a door or something like that and you're doing it under pressure and this monster is bearing down and you, you're going to be flustered and, and struggling with the task that you're performing. So I think there's so many elements in the game that it's like you can design a game and stick to immersive symbol philosophy because you respect the philosophy or you can realize that the immersive sim philosophy is now helping to make the gameplay that much better because by keeping the player grounded in the game world you're able to add so much depth to the mechanics and add so much so many more layers to what's going on you know hacking is stressful and it's terrifying and it's terrifying to be out in the open versus another game that would just either be a progress bar or you have a disposable hack tool you just use it immediately it's it's used up and the doors open you know um, and of course the game isn't perfect like this you know your map is literally like a screen that you open up and time freezes if I'm not mistaken crafting is the same way crafting is a literally a, a menu that open up and time doesn't you know time freezes but hey it's like with all these other commitments to immersion it's you know I don't think it breaks immersion enough to really matter you know, as long as all these other things are there. And at the end of the day, is it, it is a game. It's not like complete matrix simulation. You can't, you have to expect things like game menus and this and that and saving and all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, Alien Isolation is, I think, a really great example of immersive sim game design. And it's one that a lot of people don't talk about as an immersive sim. And so this is one of the other reasons I wanted to do this video is to showcase games that are non-traditionally thought of as immersive sims that after some digging you you realize are, are fundamentally immersive sim games so moving on the next game on the list is another outlier that is an excellent game called neon struct uh actually neon struct with the subtitle die augen der welt which i don't know what that means um neon struct is a phenomenal game it is important for a number of reasons. So first of all, a little, little rundown on Neon Struct. Neon Struct is, the best way I can describe it is, it is a, a short indie game using the mechanics of the original Thief games, one and two, um, set in a world very similar to 
Deus Ex with a Minecraft level of visual fidelity. <laughs> that is that is essentially uh, Neon Struct. And I think one of the reasons this game is really important is that it shows that one of the things that the, the head designers, the owners and operators of Arcane have sort of lamented is that they love immersive sims and they love this family of games and they love the design philosophy but it is incredibly difficult to make these games um, compared to something else. One of the things I love about Neon Struct is that it kind of shows you that you don't have to have a giant team and you never did, I mean back in the day they didn't and they had more rudimentary graphics which was probably one of the reasons they didn't need big teams. You don't have to have a huge, super big team you don't have to use a super sophisticated engine or, or make your own in-house engine. And you don't have to make a super long, you know, drawn out game with like all this stuff. You can make uh, an immersive sim or immersive sim styled game in the indie sphere. And this is one of the first games that I think really succeeded at it is Neon Struct. Um, basically just aping entirely the, uh, the gameplay of Thief. Um, but kind of, you know, as elegant as Thief is, it, it makes it even more simple. So you have a light gem with gradients on it, which is perfect. You have a light and shadow system in the game, perfect. Uh, you have a, uh, you don't have a noise meter, but you will make more noises walking on different surfaces. So grass is fine, stone is okay, and then metal, you have to move, I think, a little bit more slowly. If I remember correctly, you can knock enemies out, but you don't ever want to get into combat. I don't think there's a ton of lethal approaches to deal with enemies. You'll get things like, uh, I think, like gas grenades and concussion grenades and EMP grenades and stuff like that. So if you want to take out like security cameras or bots with EMP grenades, uh, gas grenades to deal with enemies, things like that, um, you'll have those. Um, so there's different tools to help you deal with the environment and stuff like that. And every level is just a little open world that they just drop you into and they just say go nuts. And there, there are multiple ways to break, like I think one of the first levels in the game I think is one of my favorites. There's this big tower and you have to interrogate the guy at the top of the tower. And there's all these security systems and everything like that. So you can try and go in through the front door and steal security cards and you can find a stash of EMP grenades hidden in one of the cafes on the street. So it's like a whole like city block that you can explore and then the main tower and then you go you can go floor to floor dealing with the security I think you can shut off power to the building in one part so that it's dark and it's easier to get through or you can do very sort of thief-esque you can climb up the tower there's a construction yard uh, where they're building a building adjacent to the tower and you can climb up all of that and then ride a crane to almost the roof level and then jump over there so you know and it's not a dizzying amount of options and a dizzying amount of uh, gameplay features or gameplay systems but there's enough there to give you a fun experience and it is honestly a much better stealth game than most of the stuff that comes out these days and it's fairly short it's not a super long game and um like i said the story is very sort of deus ex with sort of like one world government conspiracy theories and things like that and um you play as this sort of a CIA style agent who's been disavowed and the, the whole game you're basically working without backup. Another thing I really like is there's a couple levels that just really are like little mini open worlds. There's one level where all you have to do is walk in, you're, you're, it's like this giant city block. And all you have to do is walk into this church and go in the basement and talk to this like resistance leader. That's it, that's all you have to do. But what you can do is you can go try and find a way to make money. There's a little side quest where someone wants you to collect a bunch of missing uh, concert tickets or some shit like that. And if you get them all, they'll give you a little bit of cash. And then you can go to one of the food vendors and you can, um, if you've picked up a clue elsewhere in the map, you can say, oh, hey, I'd like to see the, the um, secret menu. And then he'll actually sell you black market supplies like EMP grenades and things like that. Um, you can find keys to, you can break into places by breaking the windows or climbing into the roof to get into this hotel and break into the different rooms, or you can steal the key from behind the manager's desk and go into the individual hotel rooms and pick up supplies like food or um, um, grenades and stuff. I think it has a grid-based inventory like Deus Ex or something like that. Um, and uh, there's even a little side plot where the police are investigating, I think, a murder or a disappearance in this apartment building. And you can go in there and I think there's a secret room in the guy's apartment and you can get supplies from there. 
Um, so there's, for again, this is a very, very small scale, little tiny sort of indie game. For a game of this scope, there is an incredible amount to do just in a level where all you're supposed to do is just go talk to one person. The level can be over in 15 seconds if you want it to be, or 20 minutes. And so they tried to add a lot of depth and a lot going on in these little worlds and stuff like that. And the game gets incredibly difficult too because there there is a... There's not a lot of resources that you have. So you have to be very careful about how you use them. I think like for one, there's one, there's a cloak that'll turn you invisible, uh, sort of stim that you can get. There's another one that gives you like massive speed. Um, and the thing I really liked is that in a lot of other games it would be like, well, you, you probably only have to use these tools. Those are just if you want to. In this game you kind of have to use almost, at some point in the game you're going to have to like empty your entire inventory just to get to the end of the mission. And of course the stealth is great, like I said, because it uses that, that thief-based light and shadow and then of course noise. So you have, to be, you have to walk slowly around enemies, you have to watch what surface you're on, and you have to move in the shadows. And there's one mission in particular where there's roving robots with IR cameras so they can see you in the dark. Um, and so you have to figure out a way to just completely avoid get them. There's police patrolling the streets and then the streets are flooded with uh, street lights. So that's like one of the hardest levels of the game. And it's just, it's really fun, it's really great. And I think it qualifies as an immersive sim because it's, it's really trying to emulate the feel of something like Deus Ex and Thief. Um, certain levels like the one I talked about with the church feel a little bit more like Deus Ex where you're just you're in sort of an open sort of city environment and you can go around and talk to different characters and do different um, jobs for people and 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 find secrets and, and you know kind of pad out your inventory and things like that uh, versus games that are a lot more like Thief where they just drop you like at the beginning of like this city block but it's it's only populated by like police because it's like after curfew and you have to break into a building to steal some sort of research data or something um, and uh, yeah I mean for, like I said you know it's it's a it's not like because the graphics are so rudimentary it's not like super immersive in that sense um, but you can do things like manipulate tons of objects in the world you eat to regain health uh, you can go into like restaurants and stuff and, and buy things. You have to be careful who you talk to in, in certain um, open world sections because people may recognize you or you can give your identity away and it'll actually increase the amount of guards available in the next mission. So there are little aspects to make the world feel more real than just a, a sort of arcadey fun indie take on Thief. You know, I don't know in terms of like, you know, super precise simulation or anything like that but i think it does enough things that thief does to sort of qualify as an immersive sim and i think it's if you're a fan of the thief series or deus ex you really should play it and support the studio they do a bunch of other great stuff um and it's all very eclectic the work that they like to do but this was a really fun game i actually have a playthrough up uh, of it on this channel and i'll be doing review as well so check out neon struck oh one of the other things i love in the game is you know they tried to give you a varied tool set. You have, I think, concussion grenades to do uh, damage. You have, um, uh, you can lockpick things. You can hack things. You can, uh, so you can hack cameras. You can lockpick chests to open them. You can lockpick doors to open them. Uh, you can knock guards out. I think you can move their bodies as well. Uh, you have EMP grenades, I think, to deal with certain threats like security cameras and stuff like that. Uh, you don't have any offensive weapons, if I remember, like pistols or anything like that. Uh, but you do have um, uh, teleport grenades, which are great because, again, it's sort of like, you know, that immersive sim, like, you know, like, okay, here's a puzzle and here's some tools and what are you going to do? So they do have a mantling mechanic a la Thief in the game where if you jump up to something and you hit, like, waist height and you keep holding jump, you will actually pull yourself up over the ledge, which is also great. There is some verticality to some of the levels, too, where you can climb up the sides of buildings, stay on the rooftops, stay away from enemy patrols. Um, and there was this one level where I was in the server room and the servers were just a little bit taller than my mantle height and I need I did I had accidentally well not accidentally but I think as part of the story I had a trip the alarm in the building and there was all these like ed 209 robots like looking for me and I was just like I don't want to sneak through all that and I was trying to get to a helicopter on the roof and there was a there was a ladder to get out of the server room and onto the roof with a little gantry uh, right below it and I was like, how the hell am I going to get over there? 
I was like trying to jump and I was trying to like maybe if I can find a box and stack it and, and jump on top of the box but there was no boxes and you know the patrols were way too close for me to do anything about it well, and I was like oh yeah I got these teleport grenades and it was just great it was great to be able to be like wow this is this is kind of cool like I just totally bypassed this whole thing so I just lobbed a teleport grenade up there instantly teleported and then just climbed up to the roof so it's got little bits of stuff like that in the game that are that are cool and allow you to to circumvent whole really difficult parts by being clever um and one thing i gotta say too i mean i think there are some pretty good immersive elements like i think there's there's one mission where uh you're hiding out in your friend's apartment and you can like eat food uh out of their fridge you can go and like dick around in the bathroom and, and play with the shower and everything like that you can go and actually like play piano in the living room you can turn it off and on the tv again for an indie game of this scope it's kind of amazing all the little details that you would see in a game like Deus Ex or in a game like um, like that, but they actually put them in this game, so I really liked that. Uh, there's no progression system or anything. Um, basically, your player build, quote unquote, is just determined by what gear you have available. And there's different black market vendors and different ways to get money throughout the game world, so it's kind of a risk reward thing. And uh, yeah, it's it's a really really. Um, awesome game and I highly, re highly recommend it and um, I, I actually learned about it from this list so that's another reason why I love these lists or, or I love sort of kind of consolidating all the different titles that we're aware of that are in that immersive sim family to help us discover new things. So the next game on the list is actually uh, Deus Ex Mankind Divided and I think a lot of what I said about the original uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution is going to stand for this game, but I think the, the thing that really stands out about this game in terms of being an immersive sim is they created this sort of, I think it's Prague? Yeah, I think it's Prague. I don't remember the exact city. I know it's in Czech Republic or, or one of those uh, uh, country uh, close to it or one of those areas um, in, in sort of central slash eastern Europe there. The real breakthrough thing that they did for this game to sort of sell that the the immersion and the simulation was they basically simulated like an entire small section of a city and most of the game takes place there and it is actually one of the most convincing games or, or worlds that i've inhabited in terms of making me feel like i was in a real city because there's like an entire like th five or six story bank there that would be its own level in a in another Deus Ex game, and they made this entire like five story bank that is part of the massive sort of hub world. And the problem with this game is it's not really a hub. It was intended the city that they that they drop you in. It was intended to be a hub world between um, globe trotting missions. And the idea was this, this hub world was so massive and with, with so much, uh, so many things to explore and see that that plus all of the globetrotting would make it like this really grand experience. But um, I don't know if this has actually been debunked, so I'd love if anyone could, could clarify this for me. But at the time, I remember there were reports coming out from people who said they worked on the project that essentially what they had done, and if you've played the game, this makes a total amount of sense because the game has weird pacing in terms of the missions that take place outside of the Prague hub world. It has really weird pacing. And in addition to that, it just abruptly ends. When it feels like you're at the halfway point in the game, it just kind of ends. And what they had said was they had developed the game, a game roughly twice the size or maybe 30% bigger than this game in terms of content. And Square Enix said, hmm, we've already sunk development costs into a game this big, but it already takes like maybe 15 to 20 hours to get to the this point in the game. Why don't we just break it in half and we'll just, you can work on the second half a little bit and we'll just release it a year or a year and a half later as another whole $60 game. And the team was like, please don't do this. It's going to be a piece of shit. Not a piece of shit, but it's going to be really disappointing and really awkward if we do it this way. And uh, Square Enix said, screw it, we're going to do that. And so basically they were trying to maximize profit profitability of this game. They had a tie-in uh, graphic novel that they developed for it. They were supposed to have like an animated feature that was going to go into it as well. Um, and then of course the inf infamous microtransactions. Now one thing I have to say about this game in terms of the microtransactions is that... Um, 
I never understood why it got so much hate for having microtransactions. I understand people don't like microtransactions, I don't either. But the thing about Deus Ex is that you literally don't have to be, I don't think if you look up in the in the dictionary or the, the, the phrase book the term tacked on, I think there's just a literal picture of, of the microtransactions menu in this game next to it in that book because it could not have been more tacked on it's like a mod it's like a it's like an easily uninstallable mod that you get on like mod db it's just one little extra menu on the start uh, menu of the game and it has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on the single player campaign you can finish the entire game Almost get every single augmentation and skill and every single weapon and every single weapon mod without ever having to touch the microtransactions feature. So it is completely pointless. And I don't know why people got so pissed off about it. It just doesn't make any sense. If it, if it has no effect on the gameplay whatsoever, why do you care if Square Enix is trying to squeeze um, a few extra bucks out of idiots? You're not going to use it, so what do you care? It, has, it doesn't affect you at all. And then I think the mod your pre-order bonus thing pissed people off too, but I'm just like, okay, once again, why does this piss people, why does it matter? It, how Does it change how the game plays or if it's good or not? The only gripe I think is, is valid to have against this game is that it does feel a little, it doesn't feel unfinished. The, the plot feels unfinished and the plot feels, uh, it, do, it doesn't even feel not fleshed out, it just feels unfinished. It, it, the plot feels like it abruptly stops and then the game's over. The pacing of the game up until that point is leading you to believe that there's a lot more globe trotting to be had. And also, Prague isn't small, and it's got an incredible amount of depth. I mean, there, there's an... So I talked about the bank, there is also an opera house, an abandoned opera house in the game that is, once again, basically the size of an entire Deus Ex mission in the open world hub world. And you can go there whenever you want, um, and you can discover all the secrets there, or not. You know, it's completely up to you. And it's not the case. You can't break into every little house or apartment in the city, but it is so packed with places that you can investigate, like going to a coffee shop, you know, when the owner's not looking, go into the employee storeroom, go into the basement, discover that he's got a safe full of like black market um, Praxis kits or something like that. And so you use them on yourself to upgrade. You know, there are so many places like that in the game that you get the impression that every single house can be broken into, every single house has a little story or a little environmental storytelling bit or world building or lore or whatever. You feel like that. And there are tons of side quests and little story missions that have nothing to do with the main plot that can be accomplished purely by just exploring. Um, and as many people have said before, it is the closest approximation to what we've gotten for Warren Spector's dream game that he's talked about. His dream game being like, I just want to do the one city block, and basically just a perfect simulation of a one block of a large city. Where every single apartment you can go into, every single person has their own story to tell and everything like that, and just tons of detail and tons of depth and all that stuff. And this game, this game honestly feels like that in the overworld. That being said, the overworld still does at times kind of feel like a hub world, an incredibly well fleshed out, deep, immersive hub world, but a hub world nonetheless. So it is a little odd, it feels a little awkward playing the game when the hub world becomes just the game. And you're like, well, why am I doing all this globe trotting if the entire game's just gonna take place in this this prog map shouldn't i just be in the prog map the whole time and so it it just fe it feels jarring doing the op the 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 uh globe trotting missions though amazing they are the the aug city is as cyberpunk and dystopian as it gets and that's one of the reasons i really like the 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 newer take on the deus ex franchises a lot of the aesthetic and visual themes of Deus Ex were not really well conveyed by the art style of the original. Um, Invisible War, while well, I love the art style and I love the aesthetic, it's doing its own thing. <laughs> it's completely doing its own thing. And uh, the 
Deus Ex prequels, uh, Human Revolution and Mankind Divided, are really kind of selling uh, this this sort of like cyberpunk, like dystopian future look a lot better. Um, and they didn't sacrifice as much of the depth as you would have thought from um, the original Deus Ex game. In fact, it's an incredibly interactable world, and it doesn't really prevent you from doing that much. And you can you can do so many things in the game, and I, I love all the things that they added, like remote hacking and um, all of the traversal mechanics now, like, I felt like I could scale the entire city, like, I never felt like it was difficult to get through the environment, or that I could only scale certain things, and, I mean, I was flying over the rooftops and just doing whatever the hell I wanted, it, it was just an amazing experience, and honestly, it's my favorite of the, I like it better than Human Revolution. Human Revolution, I guess the plot's better, you know, I guess it's more sort of grandiose and epic, and so the plot flows better and everything like that, but... Uh, I love the prog level in this game, and I think the, the changes that they made, the, the upgrades that they made to the gameplay and the new abilities are just better in this game. Um, and I don't think there's a single mission or level or or um, anything in this game that I'm just like, oh, I hate this one. But like in uh, Human Revolution, um, there's a couple where it's just like, it, it definitely drags in portions. Um, Human Revolution does, especially there's a couple missions at the beginning that I just, I think are really boring and I don't like. Most of the stuff in Detroit I kind of think is boring. Um, and I, I especially don't like the director's cut. I, I wish there was, there might be a way, but I wish there was a way you could turn it off. I don't think that the levels added to the director's cut are bad. I just think they completely crack the pacing of Human Revolution over their knee, or over, over its knee because it's it's a game that I remember taking about 15 hours, and now it's like a 25-hour game with some of the director's content added in. And it's like, oh my god, like, when you finally get to the end, you're like, Jesus Christ, I don't remember it taking that long, you know? But uh, Mankind Divided, I think, is, yeah, it's, it's my favorite of the prequels. It might be my favorite Deus Ex game, I'm not sure, but it's, it's a fantastic game, and it, it was unfairly lambasted. Um, I think it's, it's great, and I think it really showcases... A good example of immersive sim design philosophy and this game honestly does a better job than any other deus ex game in terms of selling the immersion part of the immersive sim design philosophy like i said you know there's those two paths there's like okay you can give the player tons of freedom and tons of choice to just do what they want or you can really sell this like really immersive world through all the simulation so you either have like high degrees of simulation and systems that allow the player to just go nuts, have fun, and have a lot of freedom, or you have a lot of simulation and systems to really sell the believability of the world. Every immersive sim has a mix of both, but some are more one way than the other, and this one actually, for a Deus Ex game, is actually leaning more towards that immersion, because um, the level of depth that you see in Prague is actually um, superimposed onto most of the other hub world or excuse me most of the other globe trotting missions in the game it's just that those missions are a lot smaller uh, the exception being of course the aug city which is a uh, fairly big level although I, I remember reports saying that it was supposed to be a lot bigger and i think you were even supposed to go back there at certain points in the game but fuck square enix you know um but um because of just the, uh, like the level of depth and detail of the game world and it's just you know you can spend hours just getting lost in Prague just just doing whatever and there's a high degree of immersion to it to make it feel like a completely real world so I think that yeah it's sort of it's sort of leaning more into some kind of thief territory Ultima underworld territory of being more about like simulating a real world because that's what the Prague hub world is it's like this is Prague this is just a, a city, there's tons of people in it, they're all doing their own thing, and most of all of the buildings have space inside that you can investigate with stuff to do, with stories, with quests, with people who have backstories and everything like that. So you can really get involved in what's going on in the city, and that's, that's what I really like about the game. Um, and of course the other thing I love about it is it just really feels like Deus Ex, you know. Um, it reminds me a lot of the first game especially with some of the globe trotting missions um i don't know it's it was a, it was a fantastic game i it's i told you it's my favorite of the prequels and i i just i think it's criminal how how people just bombed its review just and and not on the merits of whether the game was good or not but on the on the fact that they were pissed that 
Square. So basically, they're trying to hurt Square Enix, but Square Enix doesn't care. They'll just, I don't know, they'll just churn out some Final Fantasy VII flavored something uh, to make their money back. I mean, even Final Fantasy XV, which everyone claims to have hated, um, made tons of money. So they don't give a shit. Uh, the only people you're hurting by, by review bombing a game like this, that's as good as this, is um, uh, the Deus Ex team. Because Square Enix, what did they do? Instead of listening to the backlash, they just said, oh, it's not profitable, shut it down. We took a big risk on this game, fuck it. I would also recommend the DLC highly for this game. Um, System Rift is really, really great. It tests because you have a limited, like you can't import your character from the main game into the DLC. So you have a limited amount of augmentations, limited amount of supplies, and it really tests your skills with Deus Ex. Um, I want to say there was three DLCs, but I'm only remembering two. The other one I really like is, I forget what it's called, uh, but you play as a prisoner in Phoenix. Um, so it already had my attention right there because I'm a uh, native Arizonan, and I think it's a fantastic setting for movies, video games, whatever. So anytime a game is set in Arizona, I lose my shit. Um, you Basically, you've got me right there. The game could be the worst pile of shit ever it, though this is not and i would still love it just because it's based in arizona but though this is not it's it's really a great dlc and once again it really tests your even more so than system rift because I, I think you play most of it with your augs turned off because there's this suppression field on this prison for augs um i don't think they got the look of arizona right i mean no place in phoenix looks anything like where they put you in the game but it's still great um and I really liked it. The fact that it's really challenging too makes it a little bit tough for people like me who love to explore every nook and cranny of the world because basically you have to, it, it, it necessitates multiple playthroughs to be able to really comfortably go through and explore all of it because you are so limited in your capabilities. Um, even when you turn the augmentation field off, it's not your imported character from the game. It's still a limited number of augs, so you have to be careful. Um, but the DLC is amazing. The other good thing about this game right now, because the haters ruined it, is you can pick it up fairly inexpensively. I think you can get the Game of the Year edition with all the DLC and all the stuff included on whenever it goes on sale, which is, honestly, it goes on sale once every three weeks or so on something. Humble Bundle, which will give you a Steam key. Uh, GOG, I think it's on GOG. Um, the Xbox or PlayStation Store or Steam. Um, you can get the Game of the Year edition for like five bucks six bucks it's so cheap uh, which is also a shame because well i mean it, it wouldn't be going to the developers anyways it's just going to square enix but so yeah i guess it's good that it's cheap they don't deserve the money but you deserve the game you should check it out moving on we have dishonored 2 i'm going to include dishonored death of the outsider in talking about this game as well um to be honest, gameplay-wise, not a ton has changed from Dishonored 1 to Dishonored 2, but I ultimately think Dishonored 2 is the better game. I liked Dunwall, but all the Victor Antonov stuff, because his art design is so indivorceable from Half-Life 2, because that's what really sort of put him on the map as far as I'm concerned. I mean, that's, that's my, most of gamers knowledge of Viktor Antonov's art design comes from Half-Life 2, uh, it was just really distracting. It felt too juxtaposed, you know? For example, in Thief 2, the, the mechanists are really into Art Deco. So on their, their Nautilus, you know, 20,000 leagues under the sea Nautilus looking submarine, uh, the interior is all Art Deco. And their giant tower in the medieval city is a giant Art Deco tower with the same kind of angels you see at something like um, the Hoover Dam or something like that on top of it. So you would think that it would stick out like a sore thumb and be really juxtaposed, but the artists who put all of these things in the level really did this well. They, they, they meshed this thing that shouldn't fit into the Thief universe very well into the Thief universe and it looks it simultaneously looks like it belongs and doesn't belong but it looks more that it belongs than it doesn't you know what I mean it, the, the reason it doesn't belong is because it's just like this is medieval times that's like a 1920s through 1950s art style what the hell you know like so part of your brain says this doesn't belong but uh, 
what you're seeing in front of your eyes all meshes together. And that's one of the brilliant things of the art team that worked on Thief is they were like, you know, uh, steampunk robots in medieval times, you know, trying to, what would a medieval, like, a power generator with mostly medieval technology and metallurgy look like? Uh, what kind of lights would they have? Things like that. And they just perfectly, they made everything work and just work together. Like, nothing, things feel out of place because they shouldn't be there, but they don't look out of place. That's what Thief really succeeded at. What I didn't like in Dishonored 1 was that you've got all this, like, pretty run-of-the-mill Victorian architecture, sort of uh, Industrial Revolution era Victorian architecture, very London-esque. Um, and then just plastered throughout is just Victor Antonov's thing, the th his his one note wonder thing that he does. It worked in Half-Life. You got the same effect in Half-Life 2, where it's just like, oh, here's an Eastern European city, and here's all these uh, angular, you know, as Lovecraft would call them, cyclopean uh, non-Euclidean or something like that, although they are Euclidean because they're very angular, uh, cyclopean structures, and then of course the, the giant monolith in the center. Now the reason it worked in Half-Life 2 is it was supposed to be jarringly juxtaposed to the architecture and the look of the city, right? Jarringly because it is alien, it is not of this earth, it is not part of it, and in fact it is consuming the city around it, literally. So that's why it worked in Half-Life 2. It doesn't work in Dishonored because A, it just, you keep thinking, oh, Half-Life 2. And B, it just, it's just like, why would they build all this stuff to look like this? It just looks like fucking hell, you know? It just looks so weird. So I never really liked that part of the art of Dishonored 1. And thankfully with Dishonored 2, they um, did away with a lot of it. I mean, it still has to be there because it's part of the war now, but they, they really toned it down in the one done while, two done while levels of the game. And in the rest of the game, you are in Karnaka. And Karnaka doesn't really have a lot of that architecture because their uh, resident genius, uh, Kirin Jindosh, uh, he likes to work with more natural materials and brass and things like that. So he's got a totally different aesthetic to the, the inventions that he makes to push the technological boundaries of that culture in that city. The other thing I like is that, so because all of the technology felt very juxtaposed. It just stuck out like a sore thumb in Dishonored 1. In Dishonored 2, it it does stick out like a sore thumb, and it feels juxtaposed to the very sort of... They look like colonial buildings, like French or, or British uh, or Portuguese colonial buildings in places like South America or North Africa or something like that, um, which have a sort of Victorian sort of look to them. But they, they are made from these... All the, all the sort of weird technology is usually made from these long, 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 long beams of timber, redwood timber. And it begins to make sense why there's so much wood used in the technology, wood used in the world, because and why the city is, is built with these very narrow streets with lots of verticality, because there are these large sheer cliffs coming down the island of Karnaka or the shores of Karnaka, and right behind the cliffs are these very, very dense sort of rainforests with these large sort of uh, Brazil trees or, or redwood trees with these large big trunks and so you're just like okay yeah it doesn't fit the sort of colonial style that they're going for but it is the materials they have available so it makes it would make sense if they're making these windbreaks or these scaffoldings or these large uh, wind turbines that they would use the, the wood materials uh, available to them which are these long redwood sort of uh, beams and stuff like that. So overall, I thought that the look of the game was much better. And the the I just love the setting. I love when you have a game where it's just like, all right, we want to give you the same gameplay, but let's take it to a new setting. One of the th chief things I didn't that kind of bored me about Bioshock 2, though it is a good game, was it's like, oh, we're going back to Rapture. Okay, and that's why I thought Bioshock Infinite taking it to Columbia in the clouds, like sort of the polar opposite of a city under the sea is a city in the sky was kind of a no-brainer but also really uh i don't want to say genius but really really clever and it was a great way to have okay here's similar gameplay or at least what they were selling it here's similar gameplay but you're going to play in a totally different setting and i think the far franchises like far cry totally thrive on this it's like yep same gameplay totally new setting and it helps people from getting bored 
because visually it's distinct enough and usually the graphics are better and then there's tons of different things to explore and then the setting of course can inform different elements of gameplay you know you have like the the skylines and the skyhook in, um, in Bioshock Infinite versus um, the much more like nautical themed like pressure suits and things like that and things that were more pertaining to the world of Rapture um, you know Far Cry 4 for example has you doing you know, writing all these exotic animals that could possibly be in this part of the world. You have like tigers and stuff like that. But then of course you have elephants. And then because of all the verticality, they give you the wingsuit right away. And then they give you the little gyrocopter. So just those few things added like tons of interesting gameplay um, possibilities to the game, all informed largely by the setting. Um, so I love games where they change the setting up. And I thought Karnaka was just such a great exotic, you know, I never would have thought like the world of Dishonored would work in a setting like that, but they just made it aesthetically, visually gel together. In addition to that, um, there are uh, many levels in Dishonored 1 that I just get kind of bored by or I don't like playing. Um, for example, there's the, uh, the Assault on the Hound Pits pub, I'm not too into that level. There's the one where you get knocked out and put in that cell and then you're in that like that half sunken part of the city i'm not super into that level either i think it's very kind of like bland and boring um but yeah levels like that in dishonored one you know just every time i, I have to i replay the game i kind of groan i'm like oh, this level again i hate this level but um dishonored 2 i think for me the entire game is solid there's no level that i don't like there's no level that i don't find interesting or fun another thing that i really love about dishonored 2 is they totally like push the verticality to 11 um, because Karnaka is a very sort of uh, vertically built or step built city because it goes up these steep mountainsides. Um, I think the stealth works a little bit better in this game. I love the update to the visuals of the game. The graphics look, look much better. Um, but of course, the, the beauty of Dishonored 2 is that it's like, okay, it gives you this brand new, fresh, beautiful setting to play in, but at the end of the day it still has the same quality gameplay that you're used to from uh, Dishonored 1 and it, it didn't seem to strip out that many features from Dishonored 1 yet it added in a ton of new powers and yeah I didn't like the sort of SJW justification or reasoning that that Harvey Smith and Arcane gave for why they wanted Emily to be a playable character I think honestly there wouldn't have been any sort no one would have really cared one way or the other if they had just done it. They had just said like, oh, well, now you can play as Emily or Corvo. You know, he's been training her. I also love that they included a training mission at the beginning of the game. I do miss those from games, you know, like Half-Life um, and actually Thief the Dark Project has a pretty cool training mission with the keepers and everything like that, uh, which gives a lot of backstory. Um, so that was pretty cool, but yeah, I like I like that they let you pick, like you choose. You can play the game as Emily, you can play the game as Corvo Atano. They do, the main story beats don't really change, but they do have enough of a different play style, and the plots feel different enough in in some areas to, to merit playing as either character. And then of course, the brilliant thing about this game, excellent mission select feature, which allows you to not only mission select, but select which powers you want available, which bone charms you want equipped, all of these things that just allow you to go back to your favorite missions and just play it and experiment with all the great mechanics in the game and in addition to that if you want to do a new game plus you can have just Emily's powers you can have just Corvo's powers you can have both you can pick and choose you can do however you want to do new game plus um, you can play Corvo with some of Emily's powers and vice versa the other amazing thing they did that I think is really great in terms of the, that immersive sim path of giving the player like ultimate choice is you can play the game with no powers and that is also one of the brilliant things that arcane has done is if they want you to if they want the player to have a certain choice they will work their asses off to make sure that the game is playable with that particular build with that choice with whatever so things like going non-lethal is totally doable and there's never a point in the game where you're just like this is cheap it's it, like i'm gonna have to cheat the game or exploit it or something just to get past this because they didn't have this in mind when they designed it. Nope, it's never like that. You can play um, non-lethal, you can play totally lethal, you can play guns blazing the entire game, you can be death incarnate, 
or you can play with no powers and you would think a game like Dishonored would be like wow that's just gonna like there's gonna be so many impossible parts of the game without powers it's simply not true it was actually the hardest I had playing this game was um not being seen I think I did those playthroughs together I don't I don't remember but um no powers was not as difficult as not being seen and that should tell you the level of commitment to allowing the player to have the choice to play the game and play through the story the way they want to. And uh, I really appreciate that from Arcane. Again, you know, much like I said before, um, it's it's not really going down the path of like making a completely immersive and believable world through lots of simulation and stuff like that, but rather using lots of simulation and lots of systems and lots of freedom to create a world that is yeah largely believable but, but more about just letting the player interact with it however they want to however they would like to it's totally up to the player so it's it's much more of that sort of deus ex player choice um and dishonor 2 is i think the best in the series it is fucking amazing um some of the powers you get in death of the outsider are pretty fun and death of the outsider is a fun dlc i really liked it i think it it adds to the lore, it's an interesting story for Billy Lurk and the Outsider, and it kind of helps flesh out Dowd even more as a character. Uh, there's a lot going on in, in Death of the Outsider story-wise, and I think uh, all of the levels are great. There are some revisits to levels from Dishonor 2, and then there are some unique levels to only Death of the Outsider. Um, yeah, I would definitely get the combo pack and just get them all, or get the definitive edition which has one, all of its DLC, two, and then of course Death of the Outsider which are, are great games. Um, and Dishonored 2, I think there were probably some minor upgrades to sword combat and things like that because um, I'll, I'll patch in some more uh, footage from Stealth Gamer VR here. Um, it just seems that it's just even crazier the amount of stuff you can do and get away with and, and how fun sword combat can be in Dishonored 2. So it really, it was a great sequel because it had a n new powers, new location, the ability to play as two different characters, um, a ton of uh, sort of front end features like like uh, or menu end features like like uh, new game plus and things like that, and also the ability to do things like like the game is totally ta tailored to play um, ghosting. The game is totally tailored to play with no powers. I mean, it's just so much choice and variety, and then all of the gameplay that worked in Dishonored One is polished to a just absolute mirror shine it is just it is just a phenomenal game um and once again i i was surprised that it didn't sell super well and i i'm so surprised that these games that like you know call of duty can get away with being the most samey boring shit year after year and even the multiplayer fucking sucks and yet games with that have as much heart and inventiveness and possibilities for depth of gameplay and and crazy fun things that you can do with all their uh, systems and stuff like that because it didn't run perfectly within the first week uh yeah zero out of ten worst game ever fuck it let's review bomb it to death look i understand you waiting for a game to come out it coming out having performance issues and being pissed i totally get it but at the same time i mean think about it like how many different graphics cards how many different processors how many different types of hardware there are and hardware configurations there are to try and optimize for for any team it's it's a monumental un undertaking to make things make sure things are optimized make, sh make sure things are compatible make sure patches go out and from what i read within a couple of weeks most of the performance issues were ironed out but one of the reasons this didn't sell well was because of really bad review scores because of performance on pc so yeah, I will say though that uh, this is another game for me where I suffered from Arcane Syndrome. I have this opinion of the game now, having replayed it a million times, but uh, I definitely thought it was just kind of okay on my first playthrough, so I would make a caveat to all the Arcane inclusions on this list. Play the game over. You need to play an Arcane game like three times before you can really say, I finished it, because only upon your third time through and experimenting with different things you never tried before and ex exploration and stuff like that will you finally have an understanding of like oh wow this is all the game has to offer so for pretty much every arcane game on this list you're not going to know anything about the game on your well, not anything but you're only going to know like a surface level about the game on your first playthrough you have to do multiple playthroughs 
which is a perfect segue into the next game here, which is Prey. 